And now we bring you our next panel, Pro-Life Policy, Why Leadership and Elections Matter. And I want to introduce your moderator, Thomas J. Shaheen, Vice President for Policy at the Pennsylvania Family Institute and Council, having served in this capacity since 1991. He is responsible for a major part of Pennsylvania Family Institute's mission, to help enact laws that lead us toward a state and nation where God is honored, religious freedom flourishes, families thrive, and life is cherished. As Pennsylvania Family Council's chief lobbyist, Tom works with state lawmakers and staff on the inside of government and with grassroots coalition and pro-family leaders on the outside. Tom holds an MA in public policy from Regent University and a bachelor's from Moravian. Your moderator, Tom Shaheen. Thank you, David. Um, today, um, we titled this workshop, Pro-Life Policy, Why Leadership and elections matter. And with me today, I'm honored to have uh, State Representative Kate Clunk from York County. Um, and uh, really, uh, she's, she's here because not only does she serve her constituents well um, and jump into just about any fight I think there is on, uh, on the Hill uh, in Harrisburg, but uh, she is also considered a pro-life leader. And we've witnessed that uh, firsthand uh, with the um, uh, the shepherding through and the passage of uh, a bill known as the Down Syndrome Protection Act. Um, it was the second time around, uh, but um, Kate, I wanted to ask you about that bill. Um, specifically, um, why did you introduce it and what was important about it? Um, because some some would say uh, why run a bill when you know we have a governor who's ideologically opposed to protecting life? And why would you run a bill like that um, and, you know, knowing it's going to end up in a veto? Uh, what value does that have? What motivates you? I would say why not, Tom? Um, and you said I'm, I'm ready to, for, for a fight, and that surely was a fight. And Look, I'm a, I'm a mama bear at heart. Um, I have a daughter who's going to be three in December, and um, if you can't tell, I'm actually expecting baby number two on the way in January. So for me, pro-life issues are very important. Um, without life, what do we have? Um, and when you look at the Down Syndrome Protection Act, it is absolutely appalling that there are countries across this world that have you know, policies that it's just okay to abort a child sh solely based on that Down syndrome diagnosis. And I said, look, we're not going to have that here in Pennsylvania, not on my watch. I am going to stand up, I'm going to put forward the bill, stand up for the voiceless, and make sure that these children who are in the womb who have that particular diagnosis, they have somebody standing up as their champion. Sure. Well, thank you, and thank, thank you for doing that. Um, you know, we as advocates on the outside, uh, with Pennsylvania Family Council, as was mentioned, uh, and Pennsylvania Family Institute, we try to educate uh, the public as well as uh, try to serve lawmakers in that regard. Uh, but um, what, what value does putting forth a bill like that have, do you think, beyond uh, trying to get the bill passed? Obviously, that's primary. But what secondary effect what does that have, even even when it faces a veto or even when it takes months uh, and maybe multiple votes to get it right? We have a moral imperative, I feel, that we should be standing up for life no matter what. Um, life from, from cradle to grave and everything in between. And I think it really helps advance life in general and making sure that we are protecting those that don't have a voice and really uh, drawing those uh, extremes that the other side brings out in um, you know we're seeing it we're going to have another panelist um, who's going to talk about some things that are going on down in Virginia and, and it's scary to see what's going on potentially in other states that could be coming here to Pennsylvania so we need to make sure that we are having those conversations making sure that we are advancing those issues no matter if we're going to get the veto because someday we're going to have a legislature, we're going to have a governor that is pro-life, 
and that is going to say yes and isn't going to veto it and is going to understand that moral imperative because we have those on the other side um, that, that think that abortion is okay, that abortion on demand is okay, that, it, that think that um, not <laughs> saving the life of a, a born child um, is, is, is not okay. It's just okay for that baby to just pass away. And, and thankfully, our, our president stepped up um, this week with his executive order to, to save those children that don't have a voice. So, you know, we, we need to be making sure that we are standing up for the, the, for the voiceless. And those, uh, those families, um, when I was there in that committee meeting in the Senate, and I had those families of those children with Down syndrome sitting behind me, I truly felt that they had my back and that I had theirs that day and that we were standing up for them, for their lives and the value that they bring each and every day to their families, their friends and our communities. And, and that's what we need to stand up for. Yes, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, we, we heard soon after your bill's introduction and its introduction in the Senate by uh, Senator Martin, we heard from families that have children of all ages with Down syndrome. And they would never tell you that there weren't any problems or any struggles or anything they had to do. But you know what? They're, they're people. You know, we're each created in the image of God and, and deserve to be protected. And that's what those folks came to Harrisburg to say. You know, we had adult children, we had babies, and we had everyone in between. Um, and uh, you know what? Every one of them had a smile on their face. And I think that uh, effectively communicated as well to the committee. So I don't, if, if I could be joined by uh, my colleague, Victoria Cobb, she's in Richmond, Virginia, and heads the uh, Virginia Family Foundation. Are we connected? Yes, hello, Victoria. Hey, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry that sure. I can't be there in person. No, no problem. Thanks for joining us. I have uh, Representative uh, Kate Clunk with me, um, chair of the uh, Pro-Life Caucus here in the House. Um, Victoria, uh, what you have witnessed in Virginia, even just through recent uh, election cycles, um, is something that we watch here and think, oh, no, we better not let that happen in Pennsylvania. Tell us a little bit about what changed. Um, not only in policy, but even how things were done uh, in Virginia as a result of the elections. If you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I used to look out at California and I would say, oh, don't let us turn into that. And now you all look at us and say, don't let us uh, in Pennsylvania turn into Virginia. So um, thrilled to be here just to tell you a little bit of our story. Um, I guess on the life issue specifically, because that's the one that I think is the most telling about where our state has gone, we had made some tremendous pro-life gains over a long period of years, um, and a lot of gains very particularly in the last seven or eight years, and in fact so much so that uh, national uh, public radio, not exactly always a friend to things that we care about, but they had actually noted that we were, as a state, one of the states that was leading in our reduction of abortion. We had actually dropped the abortion rate in Virginia 41.5% in seven years, which we were overjoyed to see those kind of numbers. Um, and I wish it could be just that everybody's hearts and minds were changed, but we know that public policy plays a role in that, and it, some significant laws had passed to make that happen. So I'll tell you what those were, but I'll tell you in the context of what happened. Um, so this is to say that unfortunately we've had a big shift. Some of it's uh, demographic, but there's more than just that. And I'll, I'll share a little bit about what that is. Um, but we now have an entirely pro-abortion majority in our house in our Senate, and unfortunately our governor has made himself known nationwide with his pro-abortion stance by saying, uh, if you just birth the baby, keep it comfortable, then make a decision after the baby's born. So we know how uh, strongly pro-abortion and in fact strongly infanticide our governor is. So this is the new makeup of Virginia after the 2019 November election. So we were rolled into 2020 session and we had literally almost every pro-life policy that we've ever had, and I'm talking actually 50 years of policy erased in one bill. 
And when I say 50 years, uh, this bill erased even something that we passed in 1975, right after Roe, that said, if we're going to have abortion in Virginia, it should at least be a doctor not a nurse, a midwife, uh, you know, your local 7-Eleven cashier. We actually care that this procedure, uh, while we're making it legal, is at least not going to harm the woman. And so that's uh, one piece that got rolled back. Our informed consent for women law that has been in place since the early 2000s got eliminated. Um, there is still the words informed consent in our law, but there are no teeth to it. There's no explanation of what that needs to be. So no longer do we have, uh, in the early 2000s, it was a pamphlet that we'd give to women to say, you know, here's the information about your unborn child's gestation. Well, now we actually got passed uh, an improvement to that law right up until it was stripped out this year. And that improvement was, oh, by the way, when they do an ultrasound, which they routinely do before an abortion, we're gonna allow the woman a chance to see the ultrasound as part of her informed consent. That she, if she wants to, may view her unborn child and its gestational development before she makes up the decision. That got taken away. Uh, the one that many people are aware of is all of our safety standards were stripped away. In Pennsylvania, you know as much as any state in the nation how important safety standards are, having had the Gosnell situation happen right in your backyard and so that was stripped away. Again, all in one bill, uh, a couple of hearings, House, Senate, and I'm, I'm not even five minutes of uh, advocacy from our side was allowed on one chamber. It was just 50 years of policy stripped away in an instant because we now have liberal leadership. Um, so it's pretty tragic. Uh, and I'll just tell you, liberal leadership, pro-abortion leadership comes when uh, people are not championing the values that matter, not just voting rights. So we've had lots of legislators that used to be in our legislature vote correctly on the abortion issue, but as your representative just shared, uh, it's about championing the issue. It's about raising the discussion. It's about highlighting the value of every human life. And we did not have that level of pro-life advocacy in most of our legislature, even before it changed. We had people uh, primarily willing to take a vote, but still seemed afraid of the issue. And I think that contributes to ending up with a pro-abortion majority. And I also think, and this will be kind of the last thing I'll say on this and let you uh, circle back, but I, I also think that we can't ask our legislators, our elected officials, to champion what our churches are not willing to put forward. Um, you know, if our pastors and our, our, our faith community is not vocal and is not passionate and is not willing to stand for the most vulnerable members of our society well in the public square alongside of uh, our families, then we shouldn't expect our elected officials to stand. So all of that needs to be in place to continue to have a pro-life majority in your legislature. Well, thank you, Victoria. Um, I think the, uh, the examples you point out, uh, while they seem uh, almost, almost unbelievable, especially with the speed that some of those, especially safety regulations, reversed, I think most people um, in this audience or any audience, I think most people, um, even if they believe that abortion is, is somehow, you know, should, should be legal for those who want it in the early stages, would still support medical regulations, safety regulations, so that women don't die or that babies born alive would be kept alive. Um, so I think what we're talking about is reasonable uh, policy, reasonable uh, policy that I think is really a human rights issue. Um, Representative Clunk, if I could come back to you, I think the other side um, largely on an advocacy in this issue and their friends in the legislature and right now in the governor's office um, try to make it uh, appear as if advancing pro-life policy is somehow extreme. They fundraise off of it and, uh, and certainly scare legislators with that idea that it's extreme. What we found, and this is, I want to hear your experience, is that those advocating against these policies, particularly shown in the Down syndrome uh, debate, are... Uh, the advocacy against it is actually what's extreme, if you can speak to that. It is, and that's that's what's the extreme part about this, because if you look at the vote totals and, and you look at the bipartisan support, Tom, of pro-life issues, it's not a Republican issue and it's not a Democrat issue. It is a people-life issue. And if, if you're willing, no matter your party, to stand up for life, 
that's what's going to matter. And I think voters at home and people at home, you need to check out your local state representative, state senator, and see where they stand on these issues because they do matter. And here in Pennsylvania, we do not want, sorry, Victoria, what's happening down in Virginia, we want to be Pennsylvania, um, a commonwealth that stands up for life and, and protects and values values life and makes sure that you know individuals who do go through an abortion, that, it's, it, that it is in the most safe and secure way and that there are those safeguards in place. The fact that Virginia is stripping away all of those safeguards um, to protect women and babies is just absolutely appalling and, and would never happen and, and stand on at least my watch here in Pennsylvania. That mama bear would come out and trust me there would be more mama bears and even Democrat mama bears would be coming out. Um, Anita Kulik who heads up our pro-life uh, caucus on the Democratic side, I know she would be standing up with me sure. on that because it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. At the end of the day, we're all humans and we all should value life. Sure. Uh, Victoria, uh, you mentioned um, your, your governor, but also your state legislature taking, you know, a completely different course. Um, if you speak, speak to the idea that um, the focus uh, of the media and even of, of many of our efforts uh, sometimes is those at the top, whether it's the governor or now presidential election, but it's really important at every level, isn't it? There is no question that we need to be looking at the record if they have one or the words of every candidate on the issue of the vulnerable and it's particularly the unborn. Um, obviously right now we're seeing it at the presidential level. I mean, what could be more clear in this moment is that your vote four years ago mattered tremendously on who's going to be our new Supreme Court justice to replace uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so obviously we see it in a heightened degree at this moment, but, um, you know, many states have U.S. senators up for grabs. Um, you know, we're making decisions on who's going to confirm those appointments. Then you get down to that state level that you just mentioned. Uh, most laws that impact abortion are state laws. They are not actually typically federal laws. And in fact, even if we pro-lifers actually got what we've hoped for for a long time, which are, you know, five justices on the U.S. Supreme Court who all looked at the Constitution and saw that the right to life is the first and foremost, and they actually reversed bad precedent like Roe and Casey, all that means is it comes back to the state. That means Virginia's decision about life would be different than Pennsylvania's right now. And we just pray that we have to get our legislature back so that when when we have the decision at the state level, the ultimate decision about are we going to have abortion in our commonwealth at all, and you have the decision in Pennsylvania, are you going to have abortion in the commonwealth of Pennsylvania, um, that's where it's matter. It's going to matter a whole sure. lot who your local representatives are, who your local state your state senators are um, and honestly in Virginia we've even had it matter at the local level and that sounds interesting like mayor and we call them board of supervisors but you have the same thing what's interesting in Pennsylvania and in Virginia that may be impacted in, right. in Pennsylvania sure. is that we actually have zoning things that come down to whether abortion clinics are going to get zoning at the locality level so um, this is a critical issue and I'll tell everyone this too, where one stands on life so much impacts where they stand on many, many other issues. If you don't value the vulnerable in the position of the unborn, um, it's often going to be the case that your ability to care for the poor, your ability to look out for the elderly, when you get to questions about end of life, all of those things are very deeply connected. So we find that this is a critical question to ask when you're making a vote when you're holding legislators accountable at every level. And so um, this is a big election. Next right. year's a big election. You all know what's critical, but this should always be something on the heart and mind of a voter as you're looking at your candidates. Well, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Representative Klunk. For those who want more information on the candidates, uh, go to pafamilyvoter.com. Thank you.